Station Houston, are you ready for the event? Houston, this is Station. We are ready for the event. Julie Payette, Governor General of Canada. This is Mission Control Houston. Please call Station for a voice check. Station, this is Julie Payette calling from Canada. How do you read? Madam Payette, hello, Julie. So wonderful to talk to you. And, and I have to say on a personal note, thank you so much for the 365-day congratulatory uh, video. I really appreciated it. Thank you. It's a very small token. Uh, hello, Chris. Hello, Kate. Thank you so much for accepting to do this uh, brief conversation with me. Uh, I know this is a very busy time for you. Chris, you're about to depart. And uh, Kate, you and the two Sergey have made the, what I understand is the record speedy transfer from the Soyuz capsule to the station. Congratulations and welcome back uh, to that amazing outpost. Uh, again, I'm extraordinarily grateful that uh, you've accepted. So without further ado, uh, there's a lot of people who've been following your mission, Chris, uh, and that of Anatoly and Ivan on the ground, and we have a few questions for you. Okay, I look forward to hearing them. Thank you. So I have to tell uh, the viewers that uh, Chris is uh, doing his second long duration flight. So he's been in the station now for six months, but this is the second time this is happening. But before that, he had a short flight and we were together on board Endeavour, Space Shuttle Endeavour on STS-127. Chris is a US Navy SEAL and uh, I am just so happy that I'm catching you just before you leave uh, in this live. So Chris, how has it been on that second long duration flight. Has it been very different? Did you feel like right at home? Well, that, that's an interesting question. Kate and I were just talking about that concept and, and you get here on your second mission and it really feels like you you haven't missed a beat. You know, there's a few little things, the, the Ziploc bags are a different location or whatever and small details like this, but the feeling of uh, understanding and really uh, knowing how to operate here can, comes immediately right back. And, and uh, my first long duration mission, even though uh, you and I had been here before on Endeavour, you really feel like a visitor on a short duration flight. I always, I, if you remember, we're always asking the station crew members, where do I find this cable? How do I hook up to this computer? And when you live here, uh, that's just second nature. And, and uh, I spent the first maybe couple, three weeks of my of my first long duration mission understanding all of that stuff. And now I just kind of rolled right in, and uh, and and hit the ground hit the ground running with working. But that the the living stuff is the same as well. So overall, I, I'd say it was a much easier transition, uh, and I, I really feel like I understand the space station quite well now. Did it did it go faster, or was it the same length of time, the same cycles of isolation? It it the cumulative time went by super fast, and and we joke around up here that there's only Mondays and Fridays because you wake up on Monday morning, and next thing you know, you're uh, closing down the work week on on Friday, and everything in between is a blur. And that was definitely the case this time. It it seemed to go super fast the the whole six six months. I will tell you though that I went through the same kind of cycle as I did last time mentally, and that is you're very excited, you're motivated, you're working hard, and then some somewhere mid-mission, two-thirds of the mission, you wake up one morning and you go, ah, I've been here a long time, and I still have a long time to be here. And, uh, and, and then you get, you kind of swing through that, and I, and I remember about a th couple, three weeks ago, I was really excited to receive Kate and Sergey and Sergey and getting everything ready and, and motivation kind of shooting up again, and, and now I'm kind of riding that high till the, till the undock. So even though the time seemed uh, relatively quicker this time, my emotions did the same cycle. And it's interesting because we've been talking a lot about those uh, those cycle of when we are isolated and are only able to see people through uh, digital means because that's what we've been experiencing on the ground with the pandemic and the lockdown, certainly in the last few months. Kate, uh, it is so great to see a medical researcher back on the orbital station again. Uh, for the viewers, uh, you are um, a medical, uh, a biological, molecular biology 
and you have a PhD from Stanford University, you understand this pandemic probably better than all of us. Um, you were also the first person to sequence DNA in space. What, what do you think about this pandemic? And uh, uh, I tell people we must trust science to get out of it. Do you agree? Do you agree? Hey, Julie, it's it's great to talk to you. First of all, I'm super excited we were able to do this event. Um, and yes, I absolutely agree with you. You're 100% right. We really do need to trust science on this. I worked before I was an astronaut for many years as a virologist, and we actually uh, managed outbreak situations in places like Congo. Um, so this pandemic has been tough. It's actually been uh, really difficult to see what's happened worldwide and then close at home. So my heart really goes out to everybody that's been dealing with this. Um, and I actually lived through most of it. I, I just launched a few days ago. So we did most of our training during the pandemic. Uh, we had to sometimes train in person. And so, of course, we were in masks. We did a lot of our training remotely. We figured out how to do things by video conference that we never had thought we could do, uh, never had done before at NASA. And so I think everybody's sort of reinventing the way that we live and we work. And it is important to keep in touch with each other, to have those video calls. Um, it doesn't feel quite the same as meeting in person, but keeping in touch with your family and your friends and your loved ones, that's what we do up here. Uh, it really helps us during the six months of isolation. And so if folks on the ground can just remember that uh, and, and trust what's going on and, and really listen to the advice of your public health folks. They wanna keep you safe, they wanna keep your family safe, and they want all of us to get through this together. And these are very important tips uh, because they, even though you apply them in space, they can be applied on the ground as well in, in this difficult time. But I must say, Kate, you look terrific. It, it looks like you've always been there, even though you've just arrived back to space station. It's, a, it's as if you've never left. Uh, this is a, an amazing sight. Uh, People are asking questions. We had a few questions from uh, folks out there. Uh, they were asking uh, uh, you, what are you... Uh, going, what are you looking forward the most in this mission, this six months ahead of you? Yeah, I'm looking forward to a lot of the science, of course. Um, there's a lot of biology experiments, uh, which for me, that's, that's pretty exciting. So we're gonna continue some of the work I did with cardiovascular cells, with heart cells. Uh, we started some of that work in 2016, and so I'm really glad to be here for the continuation of that. We're doing some exciting things with uh, bioprinting and there's a lot of, exper of human experiments, of course, that are, that are always going on. So I actually just did a Canadian Space Agency experiment uh, last week, right when I got up here, um, that's looking at how you perceive time and space. Your brain changes a bit when you get to space and, and the way you perceive things is totally different. And so some of the scientists are trying to study that. I'm really, really looking forward to uh, greeting Crew-1 when they get up here, too. So uh, they're going to launch soon, and we're going to welcome them through, through the hatch, and I think that's just going to be a wonderful thing to see all those folks on board. It is an amazing time with the uh, commercial flight that has now started. And of course, Chris, uh, I saw you welcoming uh, Bob and Dog uh, just a few months ago, and that was another amazing sight uh, from, from my perspective because of STS-127. I have a question from uh, two uh, young people from Calgary, Alberta, uh, Carter and Ali Langford. Uh, they'd like to know, Chris, uh, you understand, because you're from Maine originally, that uh, Thanksgiving in Canada is in October and not in November. So they were asking if you will have a Thanksgiving meal and what's your favorite food? My my uh, my tastes ha don't haven't really changed in, on any of my missions. The things I don't like on Earth, mushrooms, I still don't like up here, and uh, um, I I I'll always love ice cream. I'll always love homemade uh, dishes right out of the oven and the smells that go along with it. So I'm really missing the smells of cooked food. It, it doesn't matter to me exactly what it is I'm about to eat, but it just, when you have that, that the smell and the anticipation of a great, great meal, it, it's, it's just a wonderful thing. Um, I will not have Thanksgiving meal up here. I'll be home 
in time uh, for the, the U.S. version of that. And, uh, and that is one of the things I'm very much looking forward to is a turkey cooking and all of those smells and the preparation that goes into it uh, and enjoying that time with, with my family. So uh, that's one thing I'm very much excited for. People are very conscious that uh, you are on board a scientific laboratory and that you're conducting scientific experiment that tells us more about ourselves so we can bring back that knowledge to Earth. I have uh, Chris McDonald from Halifax, Nova Scotia, who's wondering, uh, from your perspective, Chris, now after a veteran of two missions, more than 365 days in space, what is the most important thing that you have learned out of the missions that you've made, the experiments you've conducted, uh, and, and what does it mean? It's a profound question for our future. That is a deep and profound question. And interestingly enough, as the experiments are con being conducted while we're on board, we don't really know that much of, of the, the results and the outcome. Now, Kate might. She's pretty tied in and dialed into all the sci scientific side of it. Um, but I, I think, I'm with Kate, I think the biological uh, uh, experiments that are, that are going on are the most fascinating because, uh, A, we're participating in them. It's, it's us in, very much involved with it. And they directly impact and support uh, life on Earth as well as future exploration. So those, uh, the, the cardiac things, the DNA sequencing, all of those I find uh, pretty exciting. I had never, un unlike Kate, I, I I think the last time I ever touched a pipette was like in freshman chemistry class. And so it was really fun for me to, to use a pipette and do the, the steps involved with the DNA sequencing. Uh, I learned a lot uh, of the process myself as, as I was doing it. So, so that, that's, that's been really fun to be a part of. Uh, and, and thankfully, Kate kicked it off several years ago, and she'll continue with it. And she will. And I think that what you're doing really right now is paving the way for future humans to undertake longer missions. Uh, uh, this is uh, the 20th anniversary coming up in two weeks of uh, uninterrupted presence of human beings in space from different countries, uh, from different culture. And this is an enormous achievement in itself. And thank you for what you do. Kate, uh, I know that you've done this before. But another question we're getting, and we get a lot of this, is, is uh, of course, looking out this incredible window uh, that you have on the Earth. Uh, on your first mission, you took pictures, and I remember listening to you uh, describing your experience. But what are you looking forward? Uh, can you? And people are wondering, uh, in particular, Anne Doan from British Columbia, do you see uh, uh, things that affect us on the ground, pollution, wildfires? hurricanes? Yeah, that is a great question. Um, certainly looking out the window is one of the most surreal and sublime experiences we can have up here. Um, and it's actually, to get through my work day, I have to kind of stay away from the windows because it's so amazing. You get sucked in and uh, you'll go full orbit around the Earth 90 minutes later and then uh, somebody's calling you because you've forgotten to do your work tasks. So, <laughs> so sometimes we'll look out that we'll get up early uh, in the morning, for example, on the weekend, and we take a lot of pictures. Um, it's amazing what we can see from up here. It's also nice sometimes just to float around the earth and observe without even the camera in front of you. We were talking about that at dinner the other night with our Russian colleagues, just to take it in yourself. Uh, we can see an amazing amount of things that affect the planet from this vantage point. So one of the things that was the most striking to me the first time was actually watching weather systems move across the globe and how interconnected they are. So you'll wake up in the morning and you'll watch your local weather and your local news, but you can actually see when you do an orbit around the Earth that some pattern that's up around Europe is going to get to North America a few days later. And so you can, you can basically see the jet stream, you can see uh, hurricanes start to develop off of the coast of Africa, and you can watch them as they head towards uh, the continental United States. So certainly we do see those big weather events. Um, we can see flooding through taking uh, 
pictures with a really high resolution lens on the camera. And we actually do that to help out uh, folks. So there's a really neat international effort that will mobilize a lot of different space assets. Uh, for example, there's flooding in Bangladesh and, and we get that message right away and we take pictures and, and help folks that are trying to recover from that. Uh, we can definitely see wildfires. Uh, we can see dust storms moving across the Atlantic. And I think pretty much every, every astronaut agrees that the most striking thing that we see is a very fragile layer of atmosphere above our Earth. And, and we get this sense that, you know, it's, it's a big planet, but it's not protected by a lot. And it's really up to us to take care of it. And it's indeed very interconnected. We see it now with this virus who has spread throughout the planet, does not know any borders, does not know any timeline, and is affecting us all. And it's together that will fight it and vanquish it. Uh, I believe I'm out of time already. Uh, I cannot thank you again uh, so much. I am so glad, Chris, we had a chance to connect. And Kate, all the best. Chris, uh, uh, to you, Anatoly and Ivan, safe return to Earth. Uh, I look forward to seeing you in person when that is possible again. And uh, Kate, have the best of mission. Uh, my salutations to Sergey and Sergey. I know the change of command is uh, is uh, next uh, tomorrow. So all the best to you and uh, actually to everybody listening, uh, to the folks at Mission Control, to the people from NASA, the Canadian Space Agency, European Space Agency, Japanese Space Agency, and the Russian Space Agency. Congratulations, 20 years of uninterrupted presence of human beings in space. It's, uh, it's, it's uh, an amazing feat and it's preparing uh, for life on Earth better. Thank you again. Thank you, Julie. Well said and wonderful to talk to you. Take care. All the best. And I'll see you soon at Rudolph Hall. Station, this is Houston ACR. That concludes our event as we count down to 20 continuous years of humans living and working on the International Space Station. Thank you. And thank you to the Governor General of Canada. Station, please stand by while we reconfigure video and audio communications. And for Chris, we are ready for you to head to the airlock to terminate the loop scrub. And if you need comms, please call us on Space to Ground 4.